the master of Rohan. Now all roads were running together to the east to meet the coming of war and the onset of the shadow. And even as Pippin stood at the great gate of the city and saw the prince of Dol Amroth ride with his banners, the king of Rohan came down out of the hills. Day was waning. In the last rays of the sun, the riders cast long pointed shadows that went on before them. Darkness had already crept beneath the murmuring fir woods that clothed the steep mountain sides. The king rode now slowly at the end of the day. Presently the path turned round a huge bare shoulder of rock and plunged into the gloom of soft sighing trees. Down, down they went in a long winding file. When at last they came to the bottom of the gorge, they found that evening had fallen in the deep places. The sun was gone. Twilight lay upon the waterfalls. All day far below them, a leaping stream had run down from the high pass behind, cleaving its narrow way between pine-clad walls. And now through a stony gate it flowed out and passed into a wider way. The riders followed it, and suddenly Harrowdale lay before them, loud with the noise of waters in the evening. There the white snow warp, joined by the lesser stream, went rushing, fuming on the stones, down to Edoras and the green hills and the plain. Away to the right, at the head of the great dale, the mighty Starkhorn loomed up above, above its vast butterous sweated in cloud. Above its vast buttresses sweated in cloud, but its jagged beak gloated in everlasting snow gleamed far above the world, low-shadowed upon the east, red-stained by the sunset in the west. Mary looked out in wonder upon this strange country, of which he had heard many tales, many tales upon their long road. It was a skyless world in which his eye, through dim gulfs of shadowy air, saw only ever mounting slopes, great walls of stone behind great walls, and frowning precipices, and frowning precipice, precipice, and frowning precipices ratted with mist. He sat for a moment half dreaming, listening to the noise of water, the whisper of dark trees, the crack of stone and the vast waiting silence that brooded behind all sound. He loved the mountains, or he had loved the thought of them marching on the edge of stories, brought from far away. But now he was borne down by the insupportable weight of Middle Earth. He longed to shut out the immensity 
in a quiet room by a fire. He was very tired, for though they had ridden slowly, they had ridden with very little rest. Hour after hour for nearly three weary days, he had jogged up and down over passes and through long dales and across many streams. Sometimes where the way was broader, he had ridden on the king's side, not noticing that many of the riders smiled to see the two together. The hobbit on his little shaggy gray pony and the lord of Rohan on his great white horse. Then he had talked to Theoden, telling him about his home and the doings of the Shire folk, or listening in turn to the tales of the Mark and its mighty men of old. But most of the time, especially on this last day, Mary had ridden by himself just behind the king, saying nothing and trying to understand the slow sonorous speech of Rohan that he heard the man behind him using. It was a language in which there seemed to be many words that he knew, though spoken more richly and strongly than in the Shire. Yet he could not piece the words together. At times some rider would lift up his clear voice in stirring song, and Mary felt his heart leap, though he did not know what it was about. All the same he had been lonely, and never more so than now at the day's end. He wondered where in all this strange world Pippin had got to and what would become of Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli. Then suddenly, like a cold touch on his heart, he thought of Frodo and Sam. I am forgetting them, he said to himself reproachfully, and yet they are more important than all the rest of us, and I came to help them but now they must be hundreds of miles away. If they are still alive, he shivered. Harold Dale at last, said Eomir. Our journey is almost at an end, they halted. The paths out of the narrow gorge fell steeply. Only a glimpse, as through a tall window, could be seen of the great valley in the gloaming below. A single small light could be seen twinkling by the river. This journey is over, maybe, said Theoden, but I have far yet to go. Two nights ago the moon was full, and in the morning I shall write to address to the gathering of the mark. But if you would take my counsel, said Eomer in a low voice, you would then return hither until the war is over, lost or won. Theoden smiled. Nay, my son, for so I will call you. Speak not the soft words of warm tongue in my old ears. He drew himself up and looked back at the long line of his men fading into the dusk behind. Long years in the space of days it seems since I rode west, but never will I lean on a staff again. If the war is lost, what good will be my hiding in the hills? And if it's war, what grief will it be 
even if I fall, spending my last strength. But we will leave this now. Tonight I will lie in the hall of Dulcharo. One evening of peace at least is left us. Let us ride on. In the deepening dusk they came down into the valley. Here the snowbird flowed near to the western walls of the dale. Then soon the path led them to a fort where the shallow waters murmured loudly on the stones. The fort was guarded. As the king approached, many men sprang up out of the shadow of the rocks, and when they saw the king, they cried with glad voices, Theoden king, Theoden king, the king of the mark returns. Then one blew a long call on a horn, it echoed in the wallet. Other horns answered, and lights shone out across the river. And suddenly there rose a great chorus of trumpets from high above, sounding from some hollow place, as it seemed, that gathered their notes into one voice and sent it rolling and beating on the walls of stone. So the king of the mark came back victorious out of the west to Dunharrow beneath the feet of the white mountains. There he found the remaining strength of his people already assembled. For as soon as his coming was known, captains rode to meet him at the fort, bearing messages from Gandalf. Don here, chieftain of the folk of Harrowdale, was at their head. At dawn three days ago, Lord, he said, shadow facts came like a wind out of the west to Edoras, and Gandalf brought tidings of your victory to gladden our hearts. But he brought also a word from you to cast and get the gathering of the riders. And then came the winged shadow. The winged shadow, said Theoden, we saw it also, but that was in the dead of night before Gandalf left us. Maybe, Lord, said Dunhir, yet the same or another like to it a flying darkness in the shape of a monstrous bird passed over Edoras that morning, and all men were shaken with fear, for it stooped upon Medusa, and as it came low, almost to the gable, there came a cry that stopped our hearts. Then it was that Gandalf counseled us not to assemble in the fields, but to meet you here in the valley, under the mountains. And he bade us to kindle no more lights or fires than Barest need asked. So it has been done. Gandalf spoke with great authority. We trust that it is as you would wish. Naught has been seen in Harrowdale of these evil things. It is well, said Theod. I will ride now to the hold, and there before I go to rest, and there before I go to rest, I will meet the marshals and captains. Let them come to me as soon as may be. The road now led eastward straight across the wall, which was at that point little more than half a mile in wide. Flats and meads of rough grass, grey now in the falling night, lay all about. 
but in front on the far side of the dale Mary saw a frowning wall, a last outlier of the great roots of the star court, cloven by the river in ages past. On all the level spaces there was great concourse of men, some thronged to the roadside, hailing the king and the riders from the west with glad cries, but stretching away into the distance behind there, but stretching away into the distance behind, there were ordered rows of tents. There were ordered rows of tents and boats and boats and lines of picketed horses and great store of arms and piled spears bristling like tickets of new planted trees. Now all the great assembly was falling into shadow and yet though the night Though the night chill blew cold from the heights, no lanterns glowed, no fires were lit, watchmen heavily cloaked, paced to and fro. Mary wondered how many riders there were. He could not guess their number in the gathering gloom but it looked to him like a great arm, many thousands strong. While he was peering from side to side, the king's party came up under the looming cliff on the eastern side of the valley. And there suddenly the path began to climb, and Mary looked up in amazement. He was on a road the like of which he had never seen before, a great work of man's hands in years beyond the reach of song. Upwards it wound, coiling like a snake, boring its way across the sheer slope of rock. Steep as a stair, it looped backwards forwards as it climbed. Up its horses could walk, and wains could be slowly howled. But no enemy could come that way, except out of the air, if it was dependent from above. At each turn of the road there were great standing stones that had been carved in the likeness of man huge and clumsy limbed, squatting cross-legged with their stumpy arms folded on fat bellies. Some in the wearing of the years had lost all features save the dark holes of their eyes that still stared sadly at the passers-by. The riders hardly glanced at them. The pukal man they called him, and heeded them little. No power or terror was left in them. But Mary gazed at them with wonder, and a feeling almost of pity, as they loomed up mournfully in the dusk. After a while he looked back, and found that he had already climbed some hundreds of feet above the valley. But still far below he could dimly see a winding line of riders crossing the fort and filling along the road towards the camp prepared for them. Only the king and his guards were going up into the hall. At last the king's company came to a sharp brink, and the climbing road passed into a cutting between walls of rock, and so went up a short slope and out onto a wide upland. The Pyrian felled man called it 
a green mountain filled of grass and heat, high above the deep delved courses of snowboard, laid upon the lap of the great mountains behind. The star horn southwards and northwards, the saw-toothed mass of Erinsaka, between which there faced the riders, the grim black wall of Vimorberg, the haunted mountain rising out of steep slopes of somber pines, dividing the upland into two. There marched a double line of unshaped standing stones that dwindled into the dusk and vanished in the trees. Those who dared to follow that road came soon to the black dim halt under Vimorberg and the menace of the pillar of stone and the yawning shadow of the forbidden door. Such was the dark Dunharrow the work of long forgotten men. Their name was lost and no song or legend remembered it. For what purpose they had made this place, as a town or a secret temple or a tomb of kings, none in Rohan could say. Here they labored in the dark years, before ever a ship came to the western shores or Gondor of Dunedain was built, and now they had vanished, and only the old Pukal men were left, still sitting at the turnings of the road. Mary stared at the lines of marching stones. They were worn and black, some were leaning, some were fallen some cracked or broken. They looked like rows of old and hungry teeth. He wondered what they could be, and he hoped that the king was not going to follow them into the darkness beyond. Then he saw that there were clusters of tents and boots on either side of the stony way but these were not set near the trees, and seemed rather to huddle away from them towards the brink of the cliff. The greater number were on the right, where the ferian field was wider, and on the left there was a smaller camp, in the midst of which stood a tall pavilion. From this side a rider now came out to meet them, and they turned from the road. As they drew near, Mary saw that the rider was a woman with long braided hair gleaming in the twilight. Yet she wore a helm and was clad to the waist like a warrior and girded with a sword. Hail, Lord of the Mark, she cried. My heart is glad at your returning. And you, Iori, said you. Is all well with you? All is well, she answered. Yet it seemed to Mary that her voice belied her, and he would have thought that she had been weeping, if that could be believed of one so stern of face. All is well. It was a weary road for the people to take. Torn suddenly, from their homes. They were hard words, for it is long since war has driven us from the green fields. But there have been no evil deeds. All is now ordered, as you see, and your lodging is prepared for you, for I have had full tidings of you and knew the hour of your coming. So Aragorn has come then, said Eobe. Is he still here? No, he is gone, said Eowyn, turning away and looking at the mountains dark against the east and south. 
Where does that he go? asked Yuki. I do not know, she answered. He came at night and rode away yesterday morning before the sun had climbed over the mountain tops. He is gone. You are grieved, daughter, said Teoden. What has happened? Tell me, did he speak of that road? He pointed away along the darkening lines of stones towards the Dwimorberg. Towards the Dwimorberg. Of the paths of the dead? Yes, Lord, said Eowyn and he has passed into the shadow from which none have returned. I could not dissuade him, he is gone. Then our paths are sundered, said Eowyn. He is lost. We must ride without him, and our hope dwindles. Slowly they passed through the short heats and upland grass, speaking no more until they came to the king's pavilion. There Mary found that everything was made ready and that he himself was not forgotten. A little tent had been pitched for him beside the king's lodging, and there he sat alone, while men passed to and fro, going in to the king and taking counsel with him. Night came on, and the half-seen heads of the mountains westward were crowned with stars. But the east was dark and blank. The marching stones faded slowly from sight. But still beyond, blacker than the gloom, brooded the vast crouching shadow of the Dwemer. The paths of the dead, he muttered to himself. The paths of the dead, what does all this mean? They have all left me now. They have all gone to some doom, Gandalf and Pippin to war in the east, and Sam and Frodo to Mordor, and Strider and Legolas and Gimli to the paths of the dead. But my turn will soon come, but my, but my turn will come soon enough, I suppose. I wonder what they are all talking about, and what the king means to do, for I must go where he goes now. In the midst of these gloomy thoughts, he suddenly remembered that he was very hungry, and he got up to go and see if anyone else in this strange camp felt the same. But at that very moment, a trumpet sounded, and the man came summoning him, the king's esquire, to wait at the king's board. I wonder what they are all talking about and what the king means to do, for I must go where he goes now. In the midst of these gloomy thoughts, he suddenly remembered that he was very hungry, and he got up to go and see if anyone else in this strange camp felt the same. But at that very moment, a trumpet sounded and a man came summoning him, the king's esquire, to wait at the king's board. In the inner parts of the pavilion was a small space, curtained off with broidered hangings and strewn with skins, and there at a small table sat Theoden with Eomer and Eowyn and Dunhir. Lord of Harold. Mary stood beside the king's stool and waited on him, till presently the old man, coming out of deep thought, turned to him and smiled. 
Come, Master Mariaduk, he said. You shall not stand. You shall sit beside me as long as I remain in my own lands and lighten my heart with tales. Room was made for the hobbits at the king's left hand, but no one called for any tale. There was indeed little speech, and they ate and drank for the most part in silence, until at last, plucking up courage, Mary asked the question that was tormenting him. Twice now, Lord, I have heard of the paths of the dead, he said. What are they? And where has Strider, I mean the Lord Aragorn, where has he gone? The king sighed, but no one answered, until at last Eomer spoke. We do not know, and our hearts are heavy, he said. But as for the paths of the dead, you have yourself walked on their first steps. May I speak no words of ill omen. The road that we have climbed is the approach to the door, yonder in the dim hut. But what lies beyond no man knows. No man knows, said Tiud. Yet ancient legend, now seldom spoken, has somewhat to report. If these old tales speak true, that have come down from father to son in the house of Eor, then the door under Dwimorberg leads to a secret way that goes beneath the mountain to some forgotten end. But none have ever ventured in to search its secrets since Baldor, son of Brago, passed the door and was never seen among men again. A rush, wow, he spoke. As he drained the horn at that feast, which Brego made to hallow, to hallow new-built Medusa, and he came never to the high seat of which he was the king. Folk say that dead man out of the dark years guards the way and will suffer no living man to come to their hidden halls. But at whilst they may themselves be seen passing out of the door like shadows and down the stony road. Then the people of Harrowdale shut fast their doors and shroud their windows, and are afraid. But the dead come seldom forth, and only at times so great and quiet, and coming death. Yet it is said in Harrowdale, said Eowyn in a low voice, that in the moonless nights, but little while ago, a great host in strange array passed by. Whence they came, none knew, but they went up the stony road and vanished into the hill, as if they went to keep a tryst. Then why has Aragorn gone that way? asked Mary. Don't you know anything that would explain Unless he has spoken words to you as his friend that we have not heard, said Eomer. None now in the land of the living can tell his purpose. Greatly changed he seemed to me since I saw him first in the king's house, said Eomer. Grimmer older. Fay I thought him, and like one whom the dead call. Maybe he was cold, said Theod. 
and my heart tells me that I shall not see him again. Yet he is a kingly man of high destiny, and take comfort in this daughter, since comfort you seem to need in your grief for this guest. It is said that when the Erlingus came out of the north and passed at length up the snowboard, seeking strong places of refuge in time of need, Brago and his son Baldur climbed the stair of the hold and so came before the door. On the threshold sat an old man, aged beyond guess of years, tall and kingly he had been, but now he was withered as an old stone. Indeed, for stone they took him, for he moved not, and he said no word, until they sought to pass him by and enter. And then a voice came out of him, as it were out of the ground, and to their amaze it spoke in the western tongue, the way is shut. Then they halted and looked at him and saw that he lived still, but he did not look at them. The way is shut, his voice said again. It was made by those who are dead, and the dead keep it, until the time comes. The way is shut. And when will that time be? said Baldor. But no answer did he ever get, for the old man died in that hour and fell upon his face, and no other tidings of the ancient dwellers in the mountains can our folk ever learn. Yet maybe at last the time foretold has come, and Aragorn may pass. But how shall a man discover whether that time be come or no, save by daring the door, said Eom. And that way I would not go, though all the hosts of Mordor stood before and I were alone, and had no other refuge. Alas, that a fey mood should fall on a man so great-hearted in this hour of need. Are there not evil things enough abroad without seeking them under the earth? War is at hand. He paused for at that moment there was a noise outside, a man's voice crying the name of Theod and the challenge of the guard. Presently the captain of the guard thrust aside the curtain. A man is here, Lord, he said, an errand rider of Gondor. He wishes to come before you at once. Let him come, said Theod. A tall man entered, and Mary choked back a cry. For a moment it seemed to him that Boromir was alive again and had returned. Then he saw that it was not so. The man was a stranger, though was like to Boromir as if he were one of his kin, tall and grey-eyed and proud. He was clad as a rider with a cloak of dark green over a coat of fine mail. On the front of his helm was brought a small silver star. In his hand he bore a single arrow, black feathered and barred with steel but the point was painted red. He sunk on one knee and presented the arrow to Theod. Hail, Lord of the Rohirrim, friend of Gondor, he said. 
here gone I am, errand rider of Denethor, who bring you this token of war. Gondor is in great need. Often the Rohirrim have aided us, but now the Lord Denethor asks for all your strength and all your speed, lest Gondor fall at last. The red arrow said to you, holding it, as one who receives a summons long expected and yet dreadful when it comes. His hand trembled. The red arrow has not been seen in the mark in all my years. Has it indeed come to death? And what does the Lord Denethor recall that all my strength and all my speed may be? That is the best known to yourself, Lord, said Hircon. But before long it may well come to pass that Minas Tirith is surrounded, and unless you have the strength to break a siege of many powers, the Lord Denethor bids me say that he judges that the strong arms of the Rohirrim would be better within his walls than without. But he knows that we are a people who fight rather upon horseback and in the open, and that we are also a scattered people, and time is needed for the gathering of our riders. Is it not true, Hirgon, that the Lord of Minas Tirith knows more than he sets in his message. For we are already at war, as you may have seen, and you do not find us all unprepared. Gandalf the Grey has been among us, and even now we are mustering for battle in the East. What the Lord Denethor may know or guess of all these things I cannot say, answered Hirko. But indeed our case is desperate. My Lord does not issue any command to you. He begs you only to remember all friendship and oaths long spoken, and for your own good to do all that you may. It is reported to us that many kings have ridden in from the east to the service of Mordor. From the north to the field of Dagor Lad there is skirmish and rumor and rumor of war. In the south the Haradrim are moving, and fear has fallen on all our coastlands, so that little help will come to us thence. Make haste, for it is before the walls of Minas Tirith that the doom of our time will be decided. And if the tide be not stemmed there, then it will flow over all the fair fields of Rohan, and even in this hold among the hills there shall be no refuge. Dark tidings, said Tiud yet not all unguessed. But say to Denethor that even if Rohan itself felt no peril, still we would come to his aid. But we have suffered much loss in our battles with Saruman the traitor, and we must still think of our frontier to the north and east, as his own tidings make clear. So great a power as the Dark Lord seems now to wield might well contain us in battle before the city, and yet strike with great force across the river, away beyond the gate of kings. But we will speak no longer counsels of prudence, we will come. The weapon take was set for the morrow. When all is ordered, we will set out. 
Ten thousand spears I might have sent riding over the plain to the dismay of your foes. It will be less now, I fear, for I will not leave my strongholds all unguarded. Yet six thousands, yet six thousands at the least shall ride behind me. For say to Denethor, that in this hour the king of the mark himself will come down to the land of Gondor, though maybe he will not ride back. But it is a long road, and man and beast must reach the end with strength to fight. A week it may be from tomorrow's morn before you hear the cry of the sons of Errol coming from the north. A week, said Hergon, if it must be so, it must. But you are like to find only ruined walls in seven days from now, unless other help unlooked for comes. Still you may at least disturb the orcs and swarthy men from their feasting in the white stuff. At the least we will do that, said Theoden, but I myself am new come from battle and long journey, and I will now go to rest. Tarry here this night, then you shall look on the master of Rohan and ride away the gladder for the sight and the swifter for the rest. In the morning counsels are best and night changes many thoughts. With that the king stood up and they all rose. Go now each to your rest, he said, and sleep well. And you, Master Marriott, I need no more tonight, but be ready to my call as soon as the sun is rising. I will be ready, said Mary, even if you bid me ride with you on the paths of the dead. Speak not words of omen, said the king, for there may be more roads than one that could bear that name. But I did not say that I would bid you ride with me on any road. Good night. I won't be left behind to be called for on return, said Mary. I won't be left, I won't. And repeating this over and over again to himself, he fell asleep at last in his tent. He was wakened by a man shaking him. Wake up, wake up, Master Hobito, he cried. And at length Mary came out of deep dreams and sat up with a start. It still seemed very dark, he thought. What is the matter, he asked. The king calls for but the sun has not risen yet, said Mary. No, and will not rise today, Master Holbito. Nor ever again, one would think under this cloud. But time does not stand still, though the sun be lost, make haste. Flinging on some clothes, Mary looked outside. The world was dark, the very air seemed brown, and all things about were black and gray and shadowless. There was a great stillness. No shape of cloud could be seen, unless it were far away westward, where the furthest groping fingers of the great gloom still crawled onwards and a little light leaked through them. Overhead there hung 
a heavy roof, somber and featureless, and light seemed rather to be failing than growing. Mary saw many folk standing, looking up and muttering. All their faces were grey and sad, and some were afraid. With a sinking heart, he made his way to the king. Hirgon, the rider of Gondor, was there before him, and beside him stood now another man, like him and dressed alike, but shorter and broader. As Mary entered, he was speaking to the king. It comes from Mordor, Lord, he said. It began last night at sunset. From the hills in the east falls of your realm, I saw it rise and creep across the sky. And all night as I rode it, it came back, it came behind eating, eating up the stars. Now the great cloud hangs over all the land between here and the mountains of shadow and it is deepening. War has already begun. For a while the king sat silent. At last he spoke. So we come to it in the end, he said, the great battle of our time, in which many things shall pass away. But at least there is no longer need for hiding. We will ride a straight way and the open road and with all our speed. The master shall begin at once and wait for none that dare. Have you good store in Minas Spirit? For if we must ride now in all haste, then we must ride the light with but meal and water enough to last us into battle. We have very great store long prepared, answered Hirgon. Ride now as light and as swift as you may. Then call the heralds, Yomir, said Theoden. Let the riders be marshaled. Yomer went out, and presently, and presently the trumpets rang in the hold, and were answered by many others from below. But their voices no longer sounded clear and brave as they had seemed to Mary the night before. Dull they seemed, and harsh in the heavy air, braying ominously. The king turned to Mary. I'm going to war, Master Meriadoc, he said. In a little while, I shall take the road. I release you from my service, but not from my friendship. You shall abide here, and if you will, you shall serve the lady Eowyn, who will govern the folk in my stead. But, but my, but, but Lord, Mary stammered, I offered you my sword. I do not want to be parted from you like this, Theoden King. And as all my friends have gone to the battle, I should be ashamed to stay behind. But we ride on horses tall and swift, said Theoden. And great though your heart be, you cannot ride on such beasts. Then tie me on to the back of one, or let me hang on a stirrup or something, said Mary. It is a long way to run, but run I shall, if I cannot ride, even if I wear my feet off and arrive weeks too late. Theoden smiled. 
Ra rather than that, I would bear you with me on snow, he said. But at the least you shall ride with me to the Edoras and look on Medusa, for that way I shall go. So far as Theba can bear you, the great race will not begin till we reach the plains. Then Eowyn rose up. Come now, Meriadoc, she said. I will show you the gear that I have prepared for you. They went out to get it. This request only did Aragorn make to me, said Eowyn, as they passed among the tents, that you should be armed for battle. I have granted it as I could, for my heart tells me that you will need such gear before the end. Now she led Mary to a booth among the lodges of the king's guard, and there an armorer brought out to her a small helm and a round shield and other gear. No male have we to fit you, said Eowyn, nor any time for the forging of such a hauberk. But here is also a stout jerking up leather, a belt and a knife a sword you have. Mary bowed, and the lady showed him the shield, which was like the shield that had been given to Gimli, and it bore on it the device of the white horse. Take all these things, she said, and bear them to good fortune. Farewell now, Master Mary yet maybe we shall meet again, you and I. So it was that amid a gathering gloom, the king of the Mark made ready to lead all his riders on the eastward road. Hearts were heavy and many quailed in the shadow, but they were a stern people, loyal to their lord, and little weeping or murmuring was heard even in the camp in the hold, where the exiles from Edoras were housed, women and children and old men. Doom hung over them, but they faced it silently. Two swift hours passed, and now the king sat upon his white horse, glimmering in the half light. Proud and tall he seemed, though the hair that flowed beneath his high helm was like snow, and many marveled at him and took heart to see him unbent and unafraid. There on the wide flats beside the noisy river were marshals in many companies, well nigh five and fifty hundreds of riders, fully armed and many hundreds of other men with spare horses lightly burdened. A single trumpet sounded. The king raised his hands, and then silently the host of the mark began to move. Foremost went twelve of the king's household men, riders of renown. Then the king followed with Eomer on his right. He had said farewell to Eowyn above in the hold, and the memory was grievous. But now he turned his mind to the roads that lay ahead. Behind him Mary rode on Steba with the errand riders of Gondor, and behind them again twelve more of the king's household. They passed down the long ranks of waiting men with stern and unmoved faces. But when they had come almost to the end of the line, one looked up glancing keenly at the hobbit. A young man, Mary thought, as he returned the glance, less in height and girth than
than most. He caught the glint of clear gray eyes, and then he shivered, for it came suddenly to him that it was the face of one without hope who goes in search of death. On down the gray roads they went beside the snowborn rushing on its stones, through the hamlets of Underharrow and Upborn, where many sad faces of women looked out from dark doors. And so, without horn or harp or music of men's voices, the great ride into the east, begun with which the song of Rohan were busy for many long lives of men thereafter. From dark Dunharrow in the dim morning, with Thane and Captain rode Tengel's son. To Edoras he came the ancient halls of the Mark Wardens, mist and shrouded. Golden timbers were in gloom mantled. Farewell he bade to his free people, hearts and high seats and the hallowed places where long he had feasted before the light faded. Forth rode the king, fear behind him, fate before him, felt he kept he, oaths he had taken, all fulfilled them. Forth rode Theoden, by nights and days east and onward rode the Erlingas through fold and fenmarch and Firian wood. Six thousand spears to sun landing, Mondburg the mighty under Mindoluin, seeking city in the south kingdom, Fobelagard, Fobelagard. Fire and circled, doom drove them on, darkness took them, horse and horsemen, hoofbeats afar sank into silence, so the songs tell us. It was indeed in deepening gloom that the king came to Edoras, although it was then but known by the hour. There he halted only a short while and strengthened his host by some three score of riders that came late to the weapon tank. Now having eaten, he made ready to set out again, and he wished his esquire a kindly fare. But Mary begged for the last time not to be parted from him. This is no journey for such steads as Steva, as I have told you, said Theoden, and in such a battle as we think to make on the fields of Gondor, what would you do, Master Meriadoc, sore thing though you be, and greater of heart than of stature? As for that, who can tell, answered Mary. But why, lords, did you receive me as a swarthy, if not to stay by your side? And I would not have it said of me in song only that I was always left behind. I received you for your safekeeping, answered Theoden, and also to do as I might bid. None of my riders can bear you as burden. The battle where before my gates maybe your deeds would be remembered by the minstrels but it is a hundred lieges and two to Munberg where Donator is lord I will say no more Mary bowed and went away unhappily and stared at the lines of horsemen 
Already the companies were preparing to start. Men were tightening girths, looking to saddles, caressing their horses. Some gazed uneasily at the lowering sky. Unnoticed, a rider came up and spoke softly in the hobbit's ear. Where will once not a way opens? So we say, he whispered, and so I have found myself. Mary looked up and saw that it was the young rider whom he had noticed in the morning. You wish to go whither the Lord of the Mark goes. I see it in your face. I do, said Mary. Then you shall go with me, said the rider. I will bear you before me under my cloak until we are far afield and this darkness is yet darker such good will such good will should not be denied say no more to any man but come thank you indeed said mary thank you sir though i do not know your name do you not, said the rider softly, then call me Darren Hell. Thus it came to pass that when the king set out, before Darren Hell sat Mariadoc the Hobbit, and the great grey steed Windfola made little of the burden, for Darren Hell was less in weight than many men though light and well knit in frame. On into the shadow they rode, and the willow tickets where Snowburn flowed into Antwash, twelve leagues east of Edoras, they camped that night, and then on again through the fold and through the fenmarch, where to their right great oak woods climb on the skirts of the hills under the shades of the dark Halipiri by the borders of Gondor. But away to their left the mists lay on the marshes fed by the mouths of Antwash. And as they rode, rumor came of war in the north. Lone man riding wild brought toward the foes assailing their east borders, of orc hosts marching in the vault of Rohan. Ride on, ride on, cried Eowyr, too late now to turn aside. The fence of Antwash must guard our flank. Haste now we need, ride on. And so King Theoden departed from his own realm, and mile by mile the long road wound away, and the Bacon Hills marched past, Kalenhad, Minarimon, Erelas, Nardo. But their fires were quenched. All the lands were grey and still and ever the shadow deepened before them, and hope waned in every heart.